Welcome to the Mythicist Milwaukee Show podcast. Before we get started, we'd like to extend special thanks to all the sponsors of the Myth Information Conference 3 coming up on October 21st at historic Turner Hall in Milwaukee. Freedom from Religion Foundation, the Sophia Wolf Quadracci Memorial Fund for Stem Cell Research, author of the new book Mythos Christos, Edwin Herbert, Atheist Alliance of America, Atheist Republic, Godless Engineer, Kenosha Racine Atheists and Free Thinkers, and the Atheist Community of Milwaukee. Your $300 sponsorship includes a table at the conference, one ticket to the event, and one ticket to the VIP party, as well as a mention on all of our various social media platforms, including this fine podcast. Buy your tickets and sponsorships at mythicismilwaukee.com. All of us here at Mythicist Milwaukee would like to thank all of our patrons for supporting this show. And now here's your hosts, Rob Moore and Brian Edward. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. It's the podcast that puts God last. I am here with uh, my co-host, uh, Brian Edward, fresh off a fantastic party last night with Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar. I always have to get my, uh, mind, well done. Ar- my mind around that before I, I say it. Uh, and well done to you, my friend. Uh, thanks for hosting again. Always a, a great time. Fantastic uh, uh, parties when we uh, we throw a little soiree from time to time. We and, do. Uh, uh, I think he had a good time, and so some people got to meet uh, uh, someone who's a real mover and shaker in our movement. Uh, what were yeah, your, definitely. What were your impressions of that last night? Um, he did great. I mean, he's just just in so encyclopedic and so on point with this the political situation that's going on in the Middle East, as well as how religion relates to it. And the right way to talk about it was great. And we also filmed him as a documentary um, part for the Batman and Jesus movie. You know, so we did that part as well as some other parts that were going on right now. So. The Batman and Jesus movie. Hopefully that comes out by Easter or so, uh, and a similarly appropriate date next year in 2017. So look for that. <laughs> it's rising. Yeah, yeah. Among the other things that we do, you can go to mythicistmilwaukee.com and get your uh, fingers on all of the various projects that we uh, we are mounting, uh, including the big debate on October 21st uh, between Robert Price and Bart Ehrman. So yes. be sure and go there and, uh, and get your tickets now for that. Uh, we do the little podcast here every week from... Uh, downtown milwaukee where we have uh, sort of uh, summer is a uh, in senescence at this point we are uh, <laughs> nice word moving towards uh, the uh, angular rays of the sun in uh, in fall here and we are happy to have a very very uh, special guest with us today uh, all of us excited all week to talk to uh, tony ortega who's not in fact the heir to a homemade taco fortune but <laughs> a journalist and uh, formerly the editor of the village voice and let me tell you that's enough to impress me yeah right there is somebody who grew up in connecticut and uh, ran away from his parents to get to New York City as much as he could <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, you got to read the voice, man, and see what's going on. Uh, but he's, a, in fact, a, a leading authority on Scientology, having written uh, since 1995 about uh, that pseudo-religion. Uh, and uh, in May of 2015, in fact, released a book about their uh, continued harassment of the journalist Paulette Cooper, uh, titled the, the Unbreakable Miss Lovely, which documents their, uh, their harassment of, of her. Uh, so look for that at Amazon.com and a uh, audio version soon to come. Uh, On Audible. Yeah. Thanks for joining Download us. That uh, Tony Ortega, are you there? Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. Not at all, man. You are uh, in the underground bunker right now, I take it? Yes, I am. <laughs> it sounds so clandestine and uh, uh, yeah, safe housey. And uh, what else is going on in the bunker? You got, Well, yeah. when you're dealing with Scientology, yeah, yeah, right. Is that, what, part, yeah. Is, is that what it's about, man? Are yeah. you, uh, are you under threat from you? Or they have their own jihad against you after all? Well, you years? know, when I was uh, at The Voice, I was starting to write about Scientology on the website. But part of my job when I was at The Voice was trying to get that legendary newspaper to think of itself more as a digital enterprise, right? And so I I like to lead by example. So I, I wanted to produce some web content of my own. And I started putting stories about Scientology, since that was a subject I knew, on the website. And I just would joke around that I was writing from an underground bunker because, you know, <laughs> because it was a safe thing to do. So when I left The Voice, because I wanted to write that book about Paulette, I got some advice from someone who said, listen, you can't walk away from an audience like that. You've got to keep blogging on your own so that when your book is ready, you've got an audience for it. It was a great, great piece of advice. So mm-hmm. a couple a couple of weeks after I left The Voice in 2012, I started up my own website. And so I called it The Underground Bunker because I knew my readers would be familiar with that. And uh, it's TonyOrtega.org. And so it's, it's you know, I'm a journalist. I cover Scientology every day. I report the news from around the world. And it's, it's got a wonderful, very loyal audience of, of really smart people, ex-Scientologists, 
real experts in the in the you know subject who know a lot more than I ever did, and so the the comments there are just really wonderful. Now I often think of uh, Mormonism as that last cult that became a religion, but we forget about Scientology. Right. It's really Scientology, isn't it? Well, if you want to get into defining words like religion and cult, I don't know if we're going to, you know. Well, we the government that, but. gave them, you know, it gave them in the 90s, you know, their permission to qualify as a religion. So I suppose we have to yeah, think of it. Yeah, I mean, way. it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating evolution it went through because keep in mind when L. Ron Hubbard started all this in May 1950 with a book, its title was Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. Mm. And for the first couple of years, that's how he sold it, was he was the first person to really understand how the human mind works. He had found the first way to really heal your mental problems using a particular scientific method of counseling. And it was only after, you know, he had a big, very popular period, very big boom, made a lot of money. But then it went bust. And as he was reconstituting it and trying to get out of bankruptcy, he admitted to one of his followers that, listen, things can't get any worse than they are right now. And also the government had been harassing him. And so he said, let's try the religion angle. I mean, he literally used those words in a letter we have that he sent to one of his chief followers. And so that year, at the end of 1953, that's when they first came up with the idea of Church of Scientology. So is it a science? Is it a religion? Is it just a con game with with parlor tricks? You know, it's it's an endless argument. And you talk to longtime Scientologists, they'll tell you, I mean, the people that came up in the 60s and 70s, they'll tell you that for them, it was always a science. They really believed that they were using this e-meter to go back into their past and discover things that actually happened. That There was no belief involved. And it, that the idea of a church and ministers wearing collars was purely for tax reasons. On the other hand, I've talked to Scientologists who tell me, listen, there's no question. This is my spirituality. This is my church. So I try not to argue about that too much. You know, it's like, okay, you want to call yourself a church? We'll call you the Church of Scientology. But if you're a church, why are you splitting up families? Why are you forcing young women to have abortions? Why are you paying people pennies an hour to work 112-hour weeks? So I'm not sure that the church thing – it always works for them as far as excusing their behavior. But you're right. They got tax exempt status from the IRS in 1993, and it's a very powerful protection. Indeed. Indeed. Taking advantage of the IRS in crisis at that time. And I think you used some tactics to kind of force that through. Oh, there's no question that they, you know, they lost tax exempt status in 1967. They, they, you know, after after Hubbard started a, a church of Scientology, he eventually got tax exempt status. He stopped paying taxes, but in 1967, the IRS decided, no, this is a business. And through 1991, the courts always backed them up on that. Always backed up the IRS and said, there's no question they're selling courses at more and more uh, expensive levels. You know, it's a quid pro quo. You spend, you get this back. There's no question it's a business. And But Scientology, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, just went full bore at the IRS. They not only filed 4,000 lawsuits, was what we mentioned in the movie Going Clear, but one thing that didn't make that movie is it was the personal harassment that I yes. think really finally knuck- made them knuckle under was that individual IRS employees – we're going through harassment. I mean, little things like they would find out that an IRS official, uh, you know, ex- executive owned a rental apartment, apart- you know, an apartment building and rented, you know, rented to tenants. And so they would find, they would have all the tenants file uh, code violations just to, just to harass the guy. You see wow. what I'm saying? And, and, and they would make sure that they knew that Scientology was behind it. I mean, I've talked, I talked to a former commissioner said that he would get calls all night that he knew that his office had been bugged. I mean, they made it so that it just, when in 1990, 1991, when David Miscavige, the leader of the church, and, and Marty Rathbun walked into the office of the IRS commissioner at the time, Fred Goldberg, under George Herbert Walker Bush, the commissioner just, you know, they offered him, listen, all this, all this stuff will go away. The lawsuits will go away. Everything will go away if we can just work something out. And Marty told me that, you know, the commissioner said, had pulled him aside and said, is he telling the truth? Will all this really go away? And Marty said, yeah, it will. And he said he, the guy's shoulders visibly like slumped. Mm. Like, okay, I'm done. Relax. When you can out-harass the IRS, 
And exactly. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's an astounding feat. I, it you almost know? it almost makes you want to. Uh, you, I mean, you're spinning them in a good light here. It's like, like the enemy of my enemy. You can they can mess with the IRS that badly. You know how bad they can. Right. Do they seem kinda. to know how to do it. Right. Like uh, Wesley Snipes did yeah. not fare as well. No. no Nobody uh, has. Uh, <laughs> no. That's that's really amazing. And uh, I hate to spin them like a, a hero, but uh, let's uh, let's uh, change the subject. And uh, uh, I'm going to throw another word out there. Uh, occult that kind of relates. How does uh uh, tell us what you know about L. Ron Hubbard's background there, and does that word play into the, uh, yeah, the evolution that, of the church? Yeah, this is something the Church of Scientology really doesn't like to talk about. But L. Ron Hubbard was a fascinating guy. I mean, there's no question he lived a, a, an amazing life. Uh, the only problem is that he was a tall tale teller, and it, it takes a while to get down to what really happened versus what you know the stories he spun. But one of the things that's really fascinating about him is after World War II, when he'd had a, a pretty un, you know, he had a really kind of miserable World War II experience, to tell you the truth. He was not the hero that he made himself out to be. After that experience, his wife and kids were living up in Washington State, but he wanted to hang out in Los Angeles. And he got introduced to a, uh, through a friend to a man named Jack Parsons. Now, Jack Parsons is one of these legendary, fascinating characters. At the same time that he was literally a rocket scientist who helped found JPL, he was also an occultist. And he had this large house. He apparently was from a wealthy family. And he rented out the rooms, but only, only to other eccentrics. In fact, and you guys are going to love this, he put an ad in the paper back in the 1940s saying uh, rooms for rent, but only to atheists Nice, nice. <laughs> in the wow. 1940s. So he Definitely had all a these, fringe minority. Then he had some really wacky people in there and uh, L. Ron Hubbard shows up and they become fast friends. And in fact, uh, at the time, Jack was seeing this woman named Sarah Northrup, who L. Ron uh, just really quickly took away from him, which apparently Jack wasn't all that put out about it. But um, Jack was Jack was a real fan of this British occultist named Alistair Crowley, and Crowley is a very famous guy who has a lot of interesting readings. Basically, he 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 believed that you can change your own life simply by doing what you want to, and which was kind of a radical idea in the 19th century, right, the, in the early 20th century. So, um, and he he mixed it with a lot of occult beliefs. And Jack Parsons was one of the people that really took it seriously. And so one of the things he wanted to do that Crowley had theorized was that if you did particular rituals, it was all sex magic, right? Yeah. yeah. So they, they were, they were, uh, people say black magic and that's incorrect. It was sex magic. And they, they were trying to create the condition under which the moon child could be born, who apparently could literally become the antichrist. And so, you know, that's, that's the language you hear. But what, what are we talking about? We're talking about a couple of guys in there you know, 30s, trying to get chicks to come over. So they put yes. on these bizarre outfits, burn some candles and have sex, right? And so Jack managed to attract this woman named Marjorie uh, Cameron, who, who's kind of famous in her own right. This, um, uh, cause she's an artist and stuff and she was into it. And so we have these uh, documents where they wrote about the fact that Jack was trying to create the correct conditions where he could inseminate her while Elrond was playing the scribe. And Larry Wright, in his book Going Clear, uh, explains that what was literally going on was that uh, Hubbard was taking notes in the sense that he was using a piece of parchment and his writing instrument was his organ, his member. So he was he was jerking off onto a piece of parchment wow. or something. I don't know, it's, wow. it's just bizarre, bizarre stuff. And it's all documented, right? And the, the upshot of all this is that af after a while, Elron and Sarah decided to take off. And uh, they ended up going to Florida and they had convinced Jack that they were going to do this business deal where they were going to buy a couple of boats, sail around back to California and sell them at a profit. Well, they ended up just ripping Jack off and he ended up suing them. But eventually when Hubbard um, started formulating Dianetics and then later Scientology, you you know, a professor at Ohio State University named Hugh Urban did a really good job, and, and the historian John Atak, they both have done a really good job showing how many of the ideas from Crowley you can see directly influencing Scientology in so many ways. I'll give you one tiny example. One of the weird things about science, it's just a little creepy weird thing. Scientology, lists of things in Scientology tend not to start with the number one, but the, what number zero. 
And that's a Crowley thing, right? And um, there's there's so many parallels. Like I said, Crowley believed that if you just use your mind power, you could do what you wanted. And that's ultimately what Scientology is, is that you if you go through enough counseling – you're able to go exterior from your body and then, you know, do what you want with the universe and be, and become this superhuman creature that can just move matter with your mind. So, uh, it's very obvious if you look for it that there's a lot of occult and Crowleyism in Scientology, but the Church of Scientology just hates any of this discussion. They claim that Hubbard, who had just recently been, you know, demobilized from the military after World War II, that he was secretly still working for the military in a mission to infiltrate and take down black magic in America. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm getting from this is, uh, is uh, L. Ron Hubbard was an atheist voyeur. You know, uh, his son, his son, um, actually, I've got a piece of writing of his son's that's never been published, and I, I quote part of it in my book. His son said Hubbard never talked about God throughout his life, and he was really shocked when suddenly in 53, he decided to start something called the Church of Scientology. He said he'd never been a religious guy, had never talked about it at all. And and there is no God in Scientology. You're the right. God. I mean, you're trying to become, you know, the, the idea, the basic idea of Scientology is that you're this immortal creature called a Thetan. And unfortunately, there's all kinds of things in your past that have built up this sort of mask uh, called the reactive mind that, that keeps you from seeing your true nature. If you could, you would see that trillions of years ago, you were this free-floating, incredibly powerful being who actually helped create the universe. But you're now held down with this current body that you're in and this thing called the reactive mind. And only Hubbard's counseling allows you to remove that opaque uh, part of your brain that allows you to start seeing that incredibly powerful being you actually are and allows you to go back what's down the, the whole track of existence so that you're trying to find that incident that happened 30 million years ago, 100 billion years ago that helped create those traumas in your life that are holding you back today. And that's literally what Scientology is. The counseling allows you to go back in time discover those traumas, get erase them. And so ultimately, when you finally get to the top of what's called the bridge, you're able to leave your body at will and, and regain those superhuman powers. The problem is in 60 years of Scientology, they've never once proved they can do any of this stuff. Well, and, and the narrative in Scientology is different than the narrative in Dianetics, which is his, his original uh, narrative. The Dianetics focused more on your life now this one life but then when you get to the Scientology then he starts talking about these multiple lives that you've lived prior to yeah and that's that's actually the subject of the movie The Master I, I know it's it's a little bit slow and arty but but what I found fascinating about Paul Thomas Anderson's movie is that's the moment he was exploring the fact that when when Hubbard first came out with Dianetics the idea was if you can go back to your earliest memories which occurred in the womb then you're going to be able to take away these traumas. They're called engrams and remove the, uh, the reactive mind and you'll become clear, which at that time was the highest state you could attain. All it required was the use of the book Dianetics and another and two people talking to each other and asking questions. And he even says in the book within like 20 hours, you can become clear. Well, that was uh, that excited people and you had all kinds of clubs spread up across America as everyone tried to remember. What terrible thing dad did to mom while you were a fetus in the womb that you're still carrying around today? And that's dramatized in the master. They show people like going through birth again and stuff like that. Well, after a couple of years when this thing had, had gone bust and he was rebuilding, some of his followers weren't satisfied with only going back to the womb. They wanted to go back farther. Uh -huh. And that's why when he, you know, he had actually lost the use of the word Dianetics in bankruptcy court. Hmm. So in 1952, when he regrouped in Phoenix and he had to start over again, now he called it Scientology and it didn't, it wasn't just back to the womb. In fact, the idea in Scientology is that you've lived countless times and each time you die, you're, you, th as a Thetan, you leave that meat body and you go search for a new baby being born. <laughs> the meat body. And, and you jump into the baby. And, <laughs> and so then, but that causes problems, right? So if you're jumping, if you, if you jump into a new baby as it's born, then how can you have prenatal engrams? Oh, well, then right. Hubbard has to go back. And so, so you can, you can actually see where he's trying to make Dianetics make sense with Scientology. So he has to come up with something called the genetic entity, which is sort of, I mean, it's really, you know, if you take the time to go through it, 
you can see how he was trying to backtrack and 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 make things consistent, and he never really did. Right. But yeah, that's the difference. Dianetics back to the womb. Scientology back a million years to another planet. If all of this is so well documented, how is it not seen as pure science fiction? That's one of the things. It's funny to me when the press today does a good interview with somebody. They always say, "Inside Scientology, the secrets you've never heard." I'm like. This thing has been exposed completely by <laughs> journalists and governments going back to Martin Gardner in 1952 and the, the Australian government in 1963 and the FDA in 1971 and Paulette Cooper in 1971. I mean, we're I, the stuff I'm telling you now is what Paulette Cooper told her readers in 1971. Mm-hmm. And that's one of, the, one of the things you have to know about Scientology is, is it all comes from Hubbard. And once Hubbard died in 1986, he ca- they can't change anything. So the, the the methods they use, the way they attack critics, the way they treat their own people, how they maintain discipline, they're doing the exact same things they were doing in 1966. So, and that's one of the fascinating things about it. But no, none of this stuff is really secret. It's all out there if you know where to look. And journalists have written it over and over and over again. And The difference, I think, recently is that Janet Reitman and Lawrence Wright did such a good job with their recent books. And for the first time, big publishers, you know, took them on. I mean, Paulette Cooper, very small publisher. Uh, The other books of the 70s, George Malko, Cyrus Vosper, uh, Cyril Vosper, Robert Kaufman, tiny publishers. Those books just disappeared. And by disappeared, do you mean that they were kind of sued out of existence? Every single one of them was sued out of existence. In the 1990s, uh, late 80s, 1990s, you have Russell Miller, John Atack, and and Bent Corridan. All three of those went through massive legal fights. And you can find those books, but it's not like they're sitting out on a bookstore shelf like Larry Wright's book is or Janet Reitman's. So that's the big difference today is – is that finally big publishers are, are publishing this stuff, not just Larry Wright and Janet Reitman, right. two excellent journalists, but Jenna Miscavige Hill and her memoir, uh, Leah Remini, uh, Ron yes. Miscavige. All this stuff is being published by big publishers, and we're getting movies like Going Clears. Yeah. And, 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 and I would say what, what really paved the way for that was the internet. I mean, you know, if, if it's really hard to keep secrets yep. if you're in, the internet keeps spilling them all the time. So – uh, there are still secrets in Scientology. Believe me, there are still some very things I'm always trying to get at. But the basics about what they believe in this idea that you go millions of years back in auditing that cost you several hundred dollars an hour, that's been out forever. Yeah. Did, did, did uh, Going Clear get um, sued? I mean, are they still launching these suits like they did against, I mean, t- they picked on the little guys, but Time Magazine, I think, got into it with them. And didn't that cost them millions and millions of dollars? Did, yeah. Are they still doing that? No. Like I said, those books. There was a wave of book in the, books in the seventies, and then there was a several that came out right after Hubbard died because it got a little safer. Mm-hmm. Every single one of those books got sued, and it became hard for them to right. for anybody to find them. in In nineteen ninety, uh, a few years after Hubbard died, and as Tom Cruise was becoming their next big star, they probably reached their greatest extent. And I get this from topic former executives who actually had access to enrollment documents and they would know, right? And they tell me that the biggest extent of Scientology was probably around the year 1990. They had 100,000 people around the world. They've never had the millions that they claim. That's just always a big lie. Mm -hmm. But then in May 1991, Time Magazine put them on the cover and they called them the global cult of greed or something like that. And and that was just, that was just, you know, Scientology couldn't sit down Mm -hmm. for that. And so, they sued Time. And that, they had, you know, the, the LA Times the year before had done an amazing series on Scientology and they had not been sued. But they sued Time for $416 million. And eventually, it took a little while, but eventually everything in the suit was dropped. It was, it was dismissed by the judge. But, and so Time won. But the problem was it cost them like $8 million to defend it. Oh, wow. And all the other press saw that. And so, there was a real chilling effect from that moment, from 1991 all the way to about 2005. There were a few brave people like uh, Richard Leiby at the Washington Post. He never stopped. He was—he's amazing. And uh, the Tampa Bay Times guys are, were always fantastic. But for the most part, it became a lot tougher to get Scientology stories published between 1991 and 2005. And then Tom Cruise changed the game when he suddenly came out and became Mr. Ambassador for Scientology and argued with Matt Lauer. And that sort of opened the gates again for, for stories. But they have not – after after time, 
There's another lawsuit people usually forget. They sued the Washington Post, I think in 1995, over something Richard Leiby had written about the internet and Scientology. And that's it. That's the last time Scientology sued a news organization is 1995. Right. right when the internet is starting to come out too. So, yeah. That's- yeah. And they sued and they, and what they were doing was in, in that, in that period was that the internet allowed some of the secret teachings themselves to get out. And so they were um, raiding people's homes. They were convincing judges to send marshals and raid people's homes who had put some of this material online. And that, that ended, that was a real, war between Scientology and the internet for a few years and the internet won. And, you know, now people put all kinds of their secrets out on the internet and don't get sued. But I mean, they still harass people and they still send a lot of scary letter, lawyer letters to news organizations. And for particular news organizations, that's enough. Like some of the big networks are still terrified about taking on Scientology. So, so are they changing it now? Like, obviously, they're still taking these tactics, these bullying tactics. It reminds me a lot of, you know, like the Islamist groups or Hezbollah, Tahrir, you know, the, this is bullying tactics. Who are they going after now? I mean, is it specific people? Are they trying to settle grudges? Has it become deeply personal or is it, again, always tactical like it was well, with time? What, or- what got really uh, bad for them in the um, mid 2000s is you had a bunch of top executives come out. I mean, there have always been people who've come out over the years, and some of them have gone public, and so, and all of them got harassed. But in the mid two thousands, you had all these top level people leave at the same time because Miscavige had just gone too far. He literally created a prison for his executives at their secretive international base in near Hemet, California. He had taken the the top eighty or a hundred of his lieutenants men and women who worked for him at that secret base and just stuck them in a, in an office building and locked the door. Yeah. I think and this it, is ongoing clear. This is the, that was, this is what they right. document with the musical chairs. They called, they called it the hole. It was a musical chairs thing. Right. And all those people were in it. They were in the movie, Marty Rathbun and Mark, uh, uh, Mike Rinder and Mark Headley and Tom DeVott and other people were in it. And, and, you know, for some of them, it was just too much now. I mean, they, they were locked in the, you know, imagine, you, you work in an office and you like the people you work with, but imagine if the door was locked and you had to spend all day and night with them for the next three or four years. I mean, it was horrible. And they were sleeping on the floor and they were spending all day accusing each other of crimes. And so it, one by one, several of these top executives finally escaped and they decided we got to say something. And that culminated in 2009 in the Tampa Bay Times amazing series called The Truth Rundown. So those people have been under intense harassment ever since. I mean, Mike Rinder, he just goes through it all the time. And um, I've, I've gone through some of it myself. The thing that Mike Rinder and I share was a private investigator recently went to prison because he was caught trying to hack Mike and me on behalf of the church. Uh-huh. So, so one of the things that they – well, you know, like I wrote about Paulette Cooper in the 70s. And one of the things they'll say is – well, that was a rogue group that was committing crimes. We don't do that anymore. Literally 10 days after my book came out, I was notified by the U.S. attorney that they were they were sentencing this guy. And it turns out he had been ha- trying to hack me on behalf of the Church of Scientology. Wow. So the church is still doing the same illegal stuff to its critics. And uh, some of it's very scary. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard set this all out in several policies in the 50s and 60s. And he made it clear – you know, if somebody's talking about us, if somebody's attacking us, I don't want you just to like, you know, ignore it. You go after that person. And he wanted them destroyed. I mean, his son, Nibs, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., uh, wrote that his dad didn't just want to like defeat you in a lawsuit or, or make you go away. He wanted you out of your job, out of your house, lying in a gutter somewhere, yep. staring up at him uh, on the verge of death. That's yeah. on, that's the only point when L. Ron Hubbard would be satisfied. I want his wife dead. I want his children dead. And, and, and that's one of the dead. things they do is they go and then after to your piss on his grave. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they it sounds like the untouchables. Ones. But yeah, yeah. so they, they and they're doing now. Is this it, tactically? Is this? Now it's become personal, but is it also to have credible threats for the current leaders not to leave? Because I mean, if you see this happening, you you know you want to know. Well, this this may keep somebody in that that may have wanted to bail. 
Well, that they all go through that, and whether whether you're a top executive or not, because one of the you know main features of Scientology is this counseling I was talking about, where you're going back in time or whatever. They also just want to know what's going on in your personal life, and you're you're holding on to the sensors of this thing called an e meter, which I would tell you is just measure skin galvanism and is affected by your grip, and it's just it's completely unscientific. Mm-hmm. But that's not what matters. What matters is the Scientologist believes he can't hold something back without the machine finding out. So as long as you know the machine's going to find out if you if you lie or hold something back, these people spill their guts. Yeah, I mean they t- they tell everything, every disgusting thing they've ever done in their lives, and of course the Scientologists is there, the auditors they're writing it all down, and they create these giant files on you, and 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 they will put pre- they want to know particularly about your masturbation habits. I mean they they want to know every sexual partner you've ever had, right? And so they're, you're putting all – they're writing all that down. And so when people leave, most of the people who leave the Church of Scientology, you never hear from because they know if they speak up, suddenly that material will start yeah. popping up on anonymous well, websites. Well, that part's the only part it that could. makes any sense to me, man. I mean – Right, and it could affect more than, you know, that you had lustful thoughts for somebody other than your spouse. Okay, well, then we may make sure that y- – they they get a letter saying this, right. you know, or a recording, even worse. And my well, my theory is, and we're kind of jumping ahead a little to the celebrity part, but that's fine. John John Travolta is the really interesting one to me. He's been in it since the seventies, since Welcome Back Cotter times. He has seen to gone through. He's gone through a lot. He's changed with the church, but he definitely doesn't have Miscavige's favor. Like obviously, Tom Cruise is the golden boy. Travolta, in a way, kids kind of forgotten and stuff. But I, I truly feel, and this is just me, this is my theory, I feel that he doesn't speak against the church because of that information they have on him. I think if he did come out, you know, there's rumors of him being gay and all these other rumors. And, you know, when you start sharing your inside secrets, your deep, dark secrets, like, can you imagine that coming back right. on him? That would ruin him. Yeah, so, and that's that's what, that's what Alex Gibney um, says in the movie. He he believes that, and he and Larry believe that t- what keeps John in is that he doesn't want these secrets revealed. But I I kind of think at this point, what secrets are there <laughs> that yeah. could possibly change our you know thoughts about John Travolta? I mean, there's been so much in these court documents and these 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 lawsuits against him attacking massage you know mass- massage therapists and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what what could we be told about him that would that would really be more than that. I mean, if John Travolta prefers to have sex with men and he left the Church of Scientology and said something about that, people would love him. I mean, he yeah. would be embraced, wouldn't he? Yeah, and no, I don't care. So I don't really think it's like a, a blackmail thing. The, 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 the people inside that know him, that talk to me, just say that he just – he really believes that L. Ron Hubbard is the source of all of his success in life. And, and what's that and, woman like now? What what keeps people coming to Scientology? Yeah, I don't think they're adding people very many. I mean, there's there's always a few, but I, they're really hurting on the enrollment side. Like I said, the top former executives told me that it reached a, a peak of about a hundred thousand in 1990, and and then by the mid 2000s, it was down to about forty thousand. Uh, I just talked to a guy who's the most recent upper level executive to leave. He got out in August 2013. So his information's pretty fresh. And he worked out of the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Hollywood Boulevard, where he had access every day to numbers, statistics of people taking courses all around the world. And I asked him, okay, okay, so you you had a good sense of you know how big this thing was. What would you say it is today? And he said that he thinks it's not quite twenty thousand wow. around the world. Wow, because so, like, you and, look and, at Wikipedia, it will say like five hundred thousand. You know that, that, that wow, that if that's that low, that's that's surprising. Endangered species yeah. level, right there. Yeah, I mean, and you you see a lot of other evidence that points to that. I mean, Mike Rinder, the top Scientology spokesman, uh, runs a great blog, and and what he specializes in is he gets the internal documents out showing how much they're struggling just to staff facilities, how how, how hard it's getting for them to get people to come to events. Uh, it, we see a lot of other indicators showing that it's getting down to kind of a hardcore group, yeah. and and a lot of other people have walked away. And one of the tactics I think they have to use, right, is is sanitizing L. Ron Hubbard's history because this guy is not exactly all. He's not an angel. You know, can you tell us some of the things like of the real L. Ron Hubbard and the narrative that they like to change it to? 
Well, he no, he he like I said, he did lead an amazing life. The guy, the guy was a raconteur, right? I mean, he, he knew how to ta- tell a tall tale. He was traveling a lot. Uh, but I'll give you an example. I mean, one example is Scientology insists that L. Ron Hubbard was a hero of World War II mm-hmm. and that he was the first American injured in the Pacific Theater and that he um, – he he commanded corvettes, which is their sexy word for these like small PT uh, boats. Destro- they're, well, not they're they're a, a class up okay, from yeah. that, but yep. below destroyers. And that he he was in this thirty hour epic battle with two Japanese submarines off the coast of Oregon, and he was machine gunned in the in the jungles of of uh, Papua New Guinea, and all this stuff, you know, and. You know, Lawrence Wright took the time to really get his all of his war documents, and just none of it is true. Yeah. And he, what happened was he um, he did get into the Navy. Uh, his father had been in the Navy, and he was actually doing some intelligence early in the war, which basically meant he was working to help censor letters and things like yes. that. But he got his first command in Boston Harbor, and they had uh, converted a trawler into you know put some weapons on it, and his you know his first command was just basically going to be to protect Boston Harbor. And so after this boat had been this this craft had been refitted and he got a crew, they went on basically a shakedown cruise, a twenty four hour cruise. Came back and he was fired because he was so bad in that <laughs> first twenty four hours of trying to run that boat. They said we couldn't take this guy, so he ended up on the west coast and they gave him another shot with this um, sub destroyer, you know the kind of thing that had depth charges and yeah. that kind of thing. A legitimate, you know, weapon of war. This this craft, and he took it out off the coast of Oregon, and then, and this wasn't all L. Ron Hubbard's fault. I mean, if you go through the documents, you can see that other members <laughs> okay. of his crew were convinced that they saw the signs of a Japanese sub, you know, just off the coast of Oregon, and so they started throwing depth charges, you know, thirty hours or something. I think Steve Kinane in his new book says it's fifty, but I thought it was more like thirty. But whatever, for two days, basically. Hubbard's boat and another one kept depth charging and depth charging, and they never really came up with any evidence that they'd sunk a, a, a sub. Right. They just blew well, a bunch of shit up and wasted a bunch of Well, it of turns energy. out later that when the Navy went and investigated this incident, they found that there was this magnetic deposit on the seafloor there. Uh, okay. And so their, their theory was that's what they kept coming up with on their on their instruments and that they were basically depth charging the seafloor for 30 hours. They blew it up good, though, man. Yeah, but then, you could know if you hit a sub because you'll, you'll up well, come the supplies. I mean, you, you know if this, you hit it. To this day, there are members of that crew that were still in their 90s or something or their descendants who a couple times in the last 20 years have sent out diving expeditions to try to find these subs. But – I, I hate to break it to him, but you know we won that war mm-hmm. and we got a hold of Japan's records, and Japan was never missing a sub in that area. No, and so, the submarines weren't really the main threat. You know, the Japanese submarines weren't exactly the dominant killer in World War II. Yeah, no, that wasn't the big one for them. No. So after after you know wrestling with these non-existent subs, he then sailed down the coast, down, got down to Baja. And I guess he was bored or something, but he ordered the gunners to open fire on this Mexican island for practice. That's right. <laughs> and it started an international incident. And so that's when he got fired from that command. <laughs> and uh, he ended up he ended up in the hospital and in Oak Knoll Hospital and, and at the end of the war. And of course, his story that what everyone oh, he was blinded from machine gun fire, and he'd been machine gunned, and his back was broken, and he came up with these ideas of Dianetics and healed himself. And as Tommy Davis, the former spokesman, said, "Look, if this story's not true, then our whole church is based on a lie." Well, Lawrence Wright and others have gone through those records and found he was in the hospital for hemorrhoids <laughs> and <laughs> for conjunctivitis, right, uh, and and an ulcer. Okay, and the the guy was not, the guy was never in combat. He was never fired at in anger. So that's just an example. And you can just pick any part of his life. And and and, and the truth is, he did lead an adventurous life. I mean, he did command a ship in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. He did travel to Asia when he was a teen. He did meet fascinating people. He was a glider pilot when you know in his twenties. If he just stuck to the truth. <laughs> he he was a fascinating enough guy, but he could never stick to the truth. And you know, one of the ways he tried to get famous was he was you know he was a pulp fiction writer, and he yes. wrote all these not just science fiction. I know people know him for science fiction, but he wrote westerns and romance and just anything that would pay because we're talking the depression, and, and you know it was only a penny a word. So he just 
typed. I, I've talked to other writers that knew him and said he would just literally put a, a butcher paper roll into the typewriter and slam the keys so hard he'd be sweating. He would type so fast and write a story just at one sitting. So he would do that to make money. You know, you, you need to do something to make yourself more well known. So he starts shopping this idea in the 40s that he'd written this book about some great mystery of mankind. And he'd only shared it with like a dozen people and six of them have immediately yeah. killed themselves, right? So this is how he would pump people up to get them thinking that he was a more important person than he was. There's got to be something to that, right? I want to read this because there has to be something. Is exactly. That and that was a precursor to what became Dianetics. It was called Excalibur. But, you know, but then, you know, he came out with this thing in 1950 and he was very fortunate because his editor at the science fiction magazine that he was in most of the time really got into it. And I think that's part of the why we're still talking about L. Ron Hubbard today is that he was very fortunate that his editor at the magazine really thought he was onto something and promoted the heck out of Dianetics, devoted one, almost one entire issue to it in 1950, wrote, you know, pumped up readers before it came out, continued to pump up readers after, so that when the book then came out a few weeks after the magazine article, um, it really had an audience and it really, you know, it, it caught fire. So, Suddenly, this you know L. Ron Hubbard that I don't think all that many people were taking very seriously. His friends certainly didn't take it seriously. Uh, we know that from their letters. Suddenly, he's an authority on the human mind. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Okay, well, it sounds like he's a master self promoter, and he was able no to, to able to kind of respin his story uh, to to sell it. Uh, but I, I guess what. Uh, uh, what we're getting at more is uh, is is his legend being mythicized at all? Is he seen as more than just the creator of religion in the eyes of true believers? Uh, you know, oh well, the people that the people that are Scientologists think he's the greatest human being that ever lived, and you know they'll if you ask them, do you worship him? Do you think he's a god? They're like, no, we don't think that. He's such a great, you know. But but if you look at what they think he's done and where he is today, it, it is kind of a, a analogy to God and or, or rather and Muhammad that that his Gandhi. example, yeah. the Sunnah right, like of Muhammad. Prophet, you should yeah. wanna you should wanna take his example. So when does he found like the Sea Org and and how did that relate to like actually breaking into other government offices? Was you know he was getting into right. some trouble. So he so. It came out in 1950, big boom. In 1951 was a disaster year. Everything fell apart. He regrouped in 52 at Scientology, starts slowly building it, not doing too well, creates a Church of Scientology at the end of 53. It still it starts growing at that point, 50, you know, through the 50s. And But by the late 50s, he's having problems with government in the, in the United States. And so in 1959, he moves to England. And he buys this uh, pretty nice estate from a Maharishi or something, I can't remember. And it's called St. Hill Manor in East Grinstead, New York. And that becomes his worldwide headquarters from 59 to 66. But by then, now the UK government is starting to harass him. Wow. And so he then goes, he then goes, I don't know if how many people remember this. He went to Rhodesia because he thought he might have a chance to take it over, right? <laughs> And he's down there for a few months, and they kick him out. They literally deported him. Uh, but he, because he goes down there thinking, "Oh, this stupid little country, I'll take it over." At that point, with the Rhodesia thing a failure, he can't go back to the U.S. The U.K. wants him out. It's in it's in 1966 that he makes the decision for two things. First, he creates this thing called the Guardian's Office. It becomes the most sophisticated, you know, a more sophisticated spy network than most countries had at the time, uh, to protect him from these threats. And then he also announces this thing called the Sea Project, and he creates this thing called the Sea Organization. And they take to sea in 1967. They buy three ships, and he becomes the, he, call, he, he declares himself the Commodore. <laughs> and he, he and he has this own little private navy of of three ships that eventually went, after they go to Greece they rename themselves with, they call themselves the Apollo the Diana and the Athena and he's got like three or four hundred hardcore true believers crewing these ships with him and that's he he literally runs Scientology from the ship from 1967 to 1975 safely with a, in international waters right I was just going to say like radio free he, well he, they, they would be in a port for a while until they would get kicked out so they got kicked out of Greece <laughs> they got kicked out of Morocco they got kicked out of you know and they were running out of ports and and also I think they were sick of it I mean you know life at sea is not that fun especially right. if you're out there you know under this guy and 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 one odd thing was he came back to the U.S. just briefly from 
late 72 to mid or late 73 about 10 months he was hiding out in an apartment in Queens while the ship was getting refitted in Lisbon but otherwise he was always on the ship from 67 to 75 he got sick in 74 he decided that's it we're going to go to we're going to go to the United States they were sailing for Charleston South Carolina and he got wind that federal agents were waiting for him Uh-oh. so they so they spent another year kicking around the Caribbean and then they finally parked in the Bahamas in in 1975 went to Daytona as he had picked out this little town on the Gulf Coast called Clearwater. And they secretly went in under the name United Churches of Florida and bought the Fort Harrison Hotel, which is like the main big landmark in that town. The, mm-hmm. the Rolling Stones had stayed there in like, you know, 67 and had written Satisfaction there or something crazy. And he took o- they took over that in, a, in another building called the Clearwater Bank Building. The mayor of Clearwater didn't realize he was being invaded until they already owned several buildings. And they've been there ever since. They they call it the flag land base because that's where Hubbard transferred from the flagship Apollo. Uh-huh. Right. So this but, is part – it adds to the lore. Right. Well, they wear, they wear naval uniforms to this day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the, the leader of the Church of Scientology is Captain David Miscavige of the Sea Org. And, you know, to join the Sea Org, you're no longer on the Apollo with Hubbard, but you're still signing a billion-year contract. And you're working, you know, 112 hours a week for about 40 cents an hour. A lot of these hours. people, these people don't see their families for years. I mean, it's total dedication. And you run around in these naval uniforms and salute, and you call everyone sir, men or women, and they all have ranks. But the other thing you asked me about was the spying. So it's actually something I wrote about at length in my book. In '73, when he was hiding out in Queens and the boat was being re- refashioned or you know, worked on in Lisbon. He had to kind of reflect on how things were going and he realized, look, they were running out of ports because the U.S. and and English governments had all this damaging information on them and would share it with these smaller countries. And so he decided what we need to do – the the Freedom of Information Act was pretty new at that time. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote up this very complex um, operation that he called the Snow White Project. And in the Snow White Project, they were going to use all legal methods – to get these documents that the American and and, and English governments had, but also to use any means necessary to get the rest of the documents. And so he was basically giving them a green light to to spy and that kind of thing. So it became the Guardian's office job to break into government offices around the world to find these documents that had information about Hubbard and Scientology. So from about 1974 to 1977, uh, you know, it's legendary. These Scientology spies infiltrated government offices. They broke into offices. They took out documents by the yard. It's all spelled out really well because eventually one of them turned witness and the FBI raided in July 1977 and they took away 100,000 documents, just plainly documenting all of these burglaries and spying and the way they were they were extorting people and, and destroying lives. It's it's amazing that Scientology survived that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I especially think that, so long after Watergate, right? I mean, why isn't there a Scientology gate? You it, know, the reason the reason why I think they survived it was that, you know, they're they're incredibly litigious. And as as soon as the FBI left the building, they just went into court and filed, you know, motion after motion. And so the yeah, the FBI had a hundred thousand documents, but the court said that you know Department of Justice, you can't do anything with them until these court matters are resolved. Uh. And so over that next year, Scientology went to work putting out binders to every columnist in America saying, look, we're being harassed by the government and, and the government couldn't explain why it had raided. And so they won the PR war. So by the time the documents did come out and showed how terrible the Scientologists had been acting and they went to trial – it was on page 10. You know, nobody cared yeah. anymore. So if, I think if it would happen they today. Punted it, they punted it down. And yeah, they, you're right. That's, yeah, they ended up, they sent 11 people to prison, but none of them for more than five years. And and so by that time, and by that time, Hubbard, Hubbard, by the time they all went to prison, he had gone into permanent seclusion. So they managed to survive that, but it's kind of amazing that they did. And you mentioned David Miscavige is now like the kind of the head of the Sea Org now. How did he... Did, Take us from L. Ron Hubbard's death, and I think he died aboard ship, and like to David Miscavige's rise to power. I mean, how did he work this? Was it like a Saddam Hussein kind of just strong arming people, grab. or how how did he do that? Do we know? When Hubbard when Hubbard came back to land, he was always on the run. He was just really afraid that he was going to be subpoenaed or arrested. 
And so he he was hiding out in D.C. for a while. Then that raid happened. And so then he went to the California desert for a while. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There was an arrest in D.C. And that's why he went to California. Then the raid happened. Then he went to Nevada. He was always hiding, 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 kind of semi-seclusion. But then in February 1980, he just went completely into seclusion. Right. And e- even Scientologists didn't know where he was. The only people that knew where he was were a, a young couple named Pat and Annie Broker that were with him. And after wandering around to various places like Newport Beach, they ended up on a ranch near San Luis Obispo in, in a little town called Creston. And so on this Creston Ranch was Hubbard, the brokers, and then there was a caretaker to one of them's named Steve Foth. And it's it's mainly Steve Foth talking in the last couple of years that give us some really good detail of what they were going through. Well, the reason that but Ms. Ms. Miscavige had been, he was this kid from New Jersey, actually kind of the South Philly area, and and his he, his dad they were looking for a, a problem, with, you know, the solution for his asthma that got him into Scientology. He went to England and did some training. He ended up. Um, being this young kid working on training films that was that uh, Hubbard was making in the California desert. There's these great pictures of Hubbard directing these films and this young little teenage guy operating a camera. Well, that was David Miscavige. He just somehow got himself yeah. close to Hubbard. So then when Hubbard went to in seclusion, the reason why Miscavige became powerful was Miscavige became the choke point. If Hubbard was going to communicate with the rest of the world of Scientology, Pat Broker, who was with Hubbard, would take his messages and would and would meet with Miscavige in some secret location. The person who was – and the reason I know this is the person that was driving Miscavige was John Brousseau, who I've interviewed. And John says that, oh, they would come up with a code. So they'd say, hot dog, 2 p.m. And that meant some Denny's at 3 a.m. in San Bernardino. And then they would they would meet in the in this parking lot, and so Pat would have messages from Miscavige, uh, from uh, from Hubbard. Miscavige would have dispatches from the top orgs, you know, st- mm-hmm. statistics and stuff, and they would swap it. So if you wanted to get to Hubbard, you had to go through this Miscavige guy and Pat Broker, and so these two guys became incredibly powerful. And meanwhile, Miscavige was pushing other people out of the way. There's a lot of detail on that you can read. So ultimately, when Hubbard died. At that ranch on January 24th, 1986, he had left behind a document that suggests that he had anointed Pat Broker and Annie to take over. But it's very vague. He, he named them loyal officers. He didn't say they're taking over when I'm, I've left. But I think a lot of people would have assumed that's what he meant. But then became the power struggle between Pat and Miscavige, and Pat was just no match. I mean, Miscavige was so sort of determined. And but see, if you're going to run an organization like that, just think about how ruthless you have to be. You yeah. know, yeah, it really. And he proved to be more. He proved to be more ruthless than the others. So within a year, I'm told after Hubbard died, Miscavige had done what he needed to do to basically consolidate power, and he's been running it ever since. Tony, what uh, is uh, uh, going on with our buddy David Miscavige's father, who actually lives locally? We got a local connection here in West Allis, yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah. Do you know anything about that? And uh, sure, uh, you got his uh, phone number. I, I I broke the news when he escaped. He 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 was um, in 1985. He joined the Sea Org and became an employee of his son. And he he's a trumpet player. And uh, he ended up running the orchestra at, at you know at the events. Scientology has all these events all over the world all the time, and they always have music. And so he would go around the world running the orchestra and you know working with these other musicians. But he was a Sea Org guy, so you know Sea Org people live pretty Spartan lives. And he just after a while he just couldn't take it. Is you know he, he just couldn't take working for his son who was this dictator. So in March 2012. He and his wife um, made a run for it from the international base there in Hemet. And uh, initially, they went to Virginia because he had another son living there. But then um, his wife, Becky, is from Wisconsin. And so they finally decided that they moved up there, I think, in 2013. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. And so they were up there. And that's when uh, he learned that uh, David had put private investigators on him. And a couple of private investigators were busted there in Wisconsin because – they were following uh, Ron Miscavige, but they had this arsenal in their car. I mean, they had just an incredible amount of weaponry, and it made the cops really nervous. And you can actually listen to the uh, taped interviews of these guys, and they're just – you can hear Dwayne Powell saying, guys, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not an assassin. I'm just a private eye. <laughs> and the reason why we're fortunate about all that is that these guys had a silencer for their for one of their rifles. Oh, my God. A homemade PVC pipe silencer. And Dwayne Powell was looking at 10 years in prison for it. 
Wow. Yeah. So he, so they sang like canaries and they told him everything. We're working for David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology. We follow him all day and all night. We try to rent houses near where he's living so that we can uh, put in people that can become his friends and, and get information out. They, they, they look over his shoulder and look at what's on his iPad. I mean, just amazing information. And they were getting paid $10,000 a week and they'd been doing it for more than a year. And no matter where he went in the world, they had to go. So it's just incredible. And, and you know, one thing to keep in mind is that money that David Miscavige is spending to uh, follow his dad is parishioner money that's tax exempt. You know, I mean, the taxpayers, the American taxpayers end up subsidizing this kind of behavior that the, the, the leader of the church Scientology has his own father followed 24 hours a day. Ron was real upset about that. But what made him even more upset was that his, uh, his son ordered – his sisters to just disconnect from him. So suddenly Ron's own daughters would oh, wow. talk to him. And that's when he said, I've got to, I've got to go public. And that's how you really can hurt a parent, you know, is to, is to pull the kids away. I mean, wow. It happens all the time in Scientology. You know, if, if one member of the family is critical of the church and the others are still in, it's, it's called disconnection. And you're, you know, once, once a person has been declared a suppressive person, which is what Scientology's word is for an enemy, then everybody else has to cut off all contact with them or they'll get declared a suppressive right. person. And, and speaking of um, um, family, like um, David Miscavige specifically, and I, I heard this from Leah Romini, who was saying Shelley Miscavige is missing. And I understand there was an investigation. Do, do you have any idea why he kind of put his wife into seclusion? The why is a good question. I've tried to address it. She's been gone 10 years now, mm -hmm. and it's really kind of an amazing story. Yeah, David Miscavige and Shelley Barnett were married, I think, in 1980. I might be wrong about that. But she was a she was a powerful Sea Org executive in her own right. I mean, the, the two of them ran Scientology together. And then in the, in the summer of 2005, something started to change. And Mike, I have a good story. If you look up Shelley Miscavige, 10 years gone – it's a pretty good summary of all the things we know about what happened that summer. Mm -hmm. Mike Rinder observed some things, but you know she did some things that made him unhappy. Whatever it was, what David Miscavige will do to anybody is at some point he just decides you're a non-person and you just you just disappear. And she vanished in late summer 2005. Now I know where she is. I know because of multiple lines of evidence she's being kept. At a really secret compound, I, I've made I've made mention several times of this international compound near Hemet, California. It's fairly secretive, but we know a lot about what's in it, and we've talked. I've talked to numerous people that work there, but there's a more secret compound up in the mountains of L.A. near Lake Arrowhead, and most Scientologists have never even heard of it. Wow! And and I, I I've only talked to one former Scientologist that's ever been there. And it goes by various names. It's it's the, it's the headquarters of some a, a Scientology entity called the Church of Spiritual Technology (CST). And CST is this really weird entity. Its job is to dig vaults that will hold uh, that will hold L. Ron Hubbard's writings uh, and survive a nuclear blast and nuclear holocaust. And there's one in New Mexico. There's several in California. This is the headquarters of that group. It has a vault, and there's probably I don't know 15 or 20 people that work there, and never leave. They're always they they don't interact with anybody else in Scientology. And Shelly Miscavige went up there in 2005, and she's been there ever since. Now, is she being held against her will? Is she resigned to her fate? That's a very difficult question to answer. In, in 2013, Leah Remini came out, and she complained to the LAPD. The LAPD went to check on her. Now, one thing I always try to remind people is that Leah made a missing persons report. That's a very right. limited talk to the lieutenant at the LAPD who sent his two detectives to meet her. And he said, look – he wouldn't tell me where they went, but I knew where they went. And he said, my two detectives talked to her and she said she was fine and she didn't want to make a public statement. That's all they can do, right? right? They can't, they can't question her further. But my question for the lieutenant was when they were questioning her about these things, were there other members of the church present? And he very quickly said, that's classified, uh. which I thought was really strange. And subsequent to that conversation I had with him, that lieutenant, has showed up frequently at Scientology events. And he and they advertise, Lieutenant, you know, Andre Dawson's gonna be at our next event in Los Angeles. Very strange. That but I think very strange. I there's no question in my mind that, that Shelly Miscavige is working at this very secretive compound all above Los Angeles. And she may be resigned to her fate that Dave has decided she's a non-person and she's just gonna work on their 
you know, they're archiving projects up there of L. Ron Hubbard's work. She adored L. Ron Hubbard. She was she was on the Apollo, ship Apollo with him as as a young child. So she may be resigned to her fate, and it's a little bit complicated about whether you know we can get her out or not or whatever. But you know, people like Leah want to know you know what's going on, and and I, I'm kind of amazed that with all the publicity that's happened, that David Miscavige doesn't at least trot her out or something, you know, to right. reassure people that she's okay. Mm-hmm. But it is kind of amazing when you think that the leader of a multi-billion dollar or a corporation in this country made his wife disappear 10 years ago and there's basically no, you know, oversight of it or any kind of a reckoning. Scientology whistleblower Tony Ortega here on the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. Please go to patreon.com and support the program so we can keep bringing you quality guests and great content like this. It is now time for Myth of the Day, brought to you this week by Kenosha Racine, Atheists and Free Thinkers Activism in Southeast Wisconsin. Take it away, Antonio. Uh, today's Myth of the Day is a short but classic Scientology myth. Zenu, also called Zemu, was, according to Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, the dictator of the Galactic Confederacy who 75 million years ago brought billions of his people to Earth, then known as Tijiak, in DC-8 like spacecraft, stacked them around volcanoes, and killed them with hydrogen bombs. Official Scientology scriptures hold that the Thetans, or immortal spirits, of these aliens adhere to humans, causing spiritual harm. And that is our myth of the day. Yes, yeah, so 75 million years ago, that would have been about the late Cretaceous period. <laughs> it's a little trivia. It's pretty wacky as myths go, you know. I, I gotta say, it's got some uh, got some uh, unique <laughs> aspects. And hydrogen bombs—you don't hear that in the right. average Native American mythology. No, you don't. No, you don't. And but this is, you know, the, the, with the internet exposing like OTT and operating, you know, level Thetan. And I, I remember watching Going Clear that the, the man talking about was this a test? Was this a test of my right. sanity? <laughs> That I, I can't remember who that was, but it was so Paul brilliant. Haggis. Okay, yeah, and he, Paul found out that that, in fact, was was not. Tell us your involvement with that film. Uh, it was, of course, I was on HBO. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? The, yeah, the uh, you know, L- Lawrence Wright is an amazing journalist who works for the New Yorker, and he did a ton of research for his book, Going Clear. And he mentioned, you know, he I, I got mentioned in numerous footnotes. He 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 liked some of the stories that I'd written at the Village Voice and stuff. And you know, he was he was aware of my work. And I I you know I thought his book was terrific. And then when um, Alex uh, when he and Alex were making the film, they wanted to have these uh, prominent former Scientologists. And then they called me up and I you know asked me if I wanted to be interviewed. I said sure. And uh, I don't know. I'm just I'm just real lucky. I'm in it. I, I'm just very fortunate. I mean, they already had Larry, but. I think I think they they wanted me because I can talk about Tom Cruise and 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 some of the money things about and, and the the you know Snow White stuff and so if you if you've seen the film you know they kind of used me to go through the whole IRS thing and then also talk about uh, Tom and his medal and stuff like that so yeah I'm just very fortunate I just spent three hours one day being interviewed by Alex Gibney and didn't know if any of it would be used and then they used quite a bit so and I was not paid for any of that. And then when they, they, they premiered it in Utah, I, I flew myself out. They gave me a ticket. And uh, so it was a wonderful premiere. I mean, it was like people that had been going to Sundance for 20 years were telling us they'd never seen anything like it. It was so jam-packed. They had to turn a hundred people away. People like, you know, Alec Baldwin were there mm-hmm. and just, you know, all kinds. Of, and it was just a huge hit. And so I'm just very fortunate I'm in it. And then it, then it became the most watched HBO documentary in a decade. Yeah. Nice. And it, and it won three Emmys. So, yeah, Compelling. I'm really happy I'm in it. So with everyone's livelihood being threatened, uh, what keeps you motivated? And why are you so interested in, in devoting so much of your time specifically to Scientology? You know, I think because it's it's a moving and changing story. I just decided at one point that um, I, I liked the idea of being a beat reporter on Scientology. I mean, I've been an editor of you know, long form journalism, not just the Village Voice, but some other publications, and where where we were kind of generalists. And I've done a, a number of different kinds of journalism, and I really love it. But there's something about you know being uh, uh, the guy that has the beat to keep on Scientology, and I, I just I invented that for myself. You know, no journalists were de- blogging Scientology daily until I started doing it five years ago, and um, it it just it just seemed like a natural fit because. 
there's something wacky going on with Scientology somewhere in the world every day. Mm-hmm. And and I get, you know, and it I it just built this big audience of wonderful people that send me great stuff. So I've got these correspond I've got people that help me in Australia, South Africa, various countries in Europe. I mean, they're sending me stuff every day. And I'm just I'm having a great time. And again, it's because the story is changing. Scientology's going through big changes. It was it's really been ripping apart. I I don't know how it's gonna turn out. I think that's part of what keeps me going is I, you know, people ask me what's going to happen with the scavenge when he loses even more people, or you know, is the government ever going to review tax exempt status? And I always say I just don't know, and and that actually is what keeps me interested. Is I, I I've heard rumors about the government being interested. I, you know, I talk to people every day that have left Scientology. Something's got to give at some point. You know what I'm saying? And I I want to be there in the front row to write about it when it does. Any, any idea whether it be yet another cult leader, if something did happen to Miscavige, whether he, he died unexpectedly or he got thrown in prison, like, would you see another cult leader replacing that or would this somehow change into something lighter? Like something more you know, just woo That's a good question. I, don't, I think it would be difficult for someone to step into his shoes because I think, I think if Miscavige went away for whatever reason – Scientology would then become basically a court defendant in a million lawsuits and government prosecutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it would just, I, I don't know that there's anybody that could step in and wrestled all that under control. In fact, if you read, I, I wrote about a guy, a guy named Paul Burkhart, who, who's this person I said was one of the last top executives to leave. And he was, he was saying, Tony, you don't understand. There's nobody left anymore. I mean, you know, Miscavige has driven everybody away that at one time, you know, people like Marty Rathbun and Mike mm-hmm. Rinder and Amy Scobie. And he said, now Scientology is basically being run by this woman nobody's heard of in Los Angeles and she's barely keeping it together. And I had never even heard of this woman. And so I wrote about this back in, I think, February. Um, so I, I think Scientology is going through some really amazing changes and I, I don't know. Is is the IRS ever going to review this? I mean, I just wrote a story the other day that I wanted to point out to people. I keep hearing from people. Doesn't Donald Trump remind you of L. Ron Hubbard? Doesn't don't the Trump <laughs> followers remind you of Scientologists, bullies, and all that? And I said, yeah. There's a there definitely is a point to make about that. But it's Hillary who's got all the Scientology connections. I mean, nobody. There was never been a White House more friendly to the Church of Scientology than Bill Clinton. And if, if Hillary becomes president, which it looks like she probably will. I, I don't know what her attitude is towards Scientology. I mean, we know that her husband was very friendly to it. So, I, you know, again, these are things I think are going to be really f- interesting to cover and, and watch what happens. Yeah, definitely. It's not the first show that we've done on Scientology in the short history of the Myth of the Monkey Show. One of the first uh, episodes in December of uh, 14, I guess it would have been, uh, mm-hmm. we talked to Jamie DeWolf, yes. uh, great, grand, oh, yeah. great grandson, oh, yeah. right? Are you familiar? You're signing all, uh, like, you Oh, know, yeah. I know, you know Jamie, Jamie well, and I, I wrote one of the first stories about him back in, I think, 2011 is when he did that spoken word performance about his great grandfather. He actually was doing stuff many years, you know, years before, but yeah, he's he's the son of, of uh, he's the grandson of L. Ron Hubbard Jr. He's yes. a great grandson of L. Ron Hubbard. And, um, He's and, he's and he's a performance artist and a very good one. When I when I had my book tour last year, uh, my stop in San Francisco was basically a Jamie DeWolf circus, and it was amazing. Nice. Nice. He had he he just basically threw this amazing party for me and Paulette. He's he's he, I love this guy. I think he's super talented. I think you're going to hear a lot more about him very soon. I can't say why, but I think he's he sees Scientology very clearly because he saw his family always living under the shadow of it and under the fear of saying anything about yeah, it. And yeah. this Changing is a guy, his name, even. Yeah, yeah well, he, that's not why he changed his name. J- Jamie changed his name because there was another comedian named Jamie Kennedy. His, his, his actual name is Jamie Kennedy, and he didn't want to be confused for the other Kennedy. So he, named, he then named himself after his grandfather, who had changed his name from L. Ron Hubbard Jr. to Ron right. DeWolf. So Jamie didn't change it out of for Scientology reasons, but but he did pick a Scientology name, and 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 he's got he's actually got the Scientology. But his grandfather did tattooed yeah. on his. But okay. his, you're right, his grandfather did. His dad, his grandfather wanted to distance himself from the Hubbard name and renamed himself Ron DeWolf. And then he actually sued in 1981 or two, I think he sued because he believed that his father his father had died, and he wanted proof, and he wanted to take over the estate, and then. Elron was still in seclusion, and he basically just sent the court a letter with his thumbprint, and the court accepted it. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, been a fascinating talk, and uh, we want everyone to make sure they go. Uh, it's TonyOrtega.org, The Underground Bunker. He uh, uh, has written a book called The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Yeah, this is a great appetizer uh, for that, it, isn't it? Really, <laughs> it really is. Uh, yeah, we didn't really touch on what's in there. I no, think people really enjoy the story if they read that. Yeah, go go ahead and give us a, a, a little uh, synopsis. Well, what's, what's that about? Yeah, exactly? Paulette Cooper, she was one of the first people to write a book exposing Scientology in, in 1971, and they, they really marked her for destruction. And they harassed her in numerous really interesting ways. And at one point, they framed her for a felony that had her facing 15 years in federal prison. And she almost killed herself. But wow. how she got out of that I, I has never really been told until I, I, I d- dug into it in this book. And, and they still had multiple other operations against her going years. In fact, a couple of the operations they worked against her, she didn't even know about until I investigated them. Wow. And um, another thing we discovered together was we knew that she had survived the Holocaust as a child. Her, her parents – she was born in Belgium uh, to uh, parents who were Polish Jews, and they were both killed in Auschwitz. But how she actually survived that, she didn't really know until, again, we dis- we investigated together and uh, got very lucky. We found a family that had known her parents and, and got that all nailed down. So this book really tells her story for the first time in a way that's never been told and in- includes everything from her childhood surviving the Holocaust to how she got into magazine writing to how she got onto the subject of Scientology, how they harassed her literally from 1969 to 1985 and just continuously tried to destroy her life. And they were still keep. she didn't realize this. I discovered this. They were still keeping tabs on her until at least 2010. And uh, she's a remarkable, remarkable woman. She's really something else. And she's, she's she writes about pets now <laughs> which she says dogs can't sue you so she, <laughs> she, she no, she's happy yet. with that and and uh she's really wonderful i had dinner with her uh, last last week here in new york but uh yeah so i was just very fortunate and then i had a publisher that really knew his stuff and told me listen don't write it like you're writing a newspaper story write it as if it's happening so when you read on the unbreakable miss lovely it, it kind of reads like a novel and it's all factual it's all based on court documents and interviews that i did but i wrote it in the style as if it's unfolding and i think uh, readers have told me they really enjoyed that that's yeah, cool you just wrapped up an audio version you mentioned before and Audible bought the rights, and they had me down to their studio on 7th Avenue, and I uh, read the – you know, that's hard. I don't know if you guys have done that. You know, <laughs> We've heard. You know, you, We've heard from other authors. You do it's a really sentence hard, or two, yeah. and then they're like, oh, hang on. You, you didn't pronounce that word well enough. You know, it's like, oh, endless. But but it was fun. I'm glad. I, I hope my voice is good enough for it. So that's – I don't know when it's coming out. I think it's coming out pretty soon. For those too lazy to read, get the Audible version. Hey, that, that's that's great, trips. man. On the yeah, the road trips, it's fantastic. It is. Um, On the way to work, I'm probably crank that out in a couple yeah. weeks. Yeah. We we talked about uh, definitions at the beginning. I'm going to bring it around full circle here and put you on the spot. Uh, the definitions of of cult and religion, and uh, you know, of course, those are fluid and flexible, uh, and uh, somewhat open to interpretation. But some of the tactics that we've uh, talked about today, uh, when people try to leave the church or speak out against it, uh, I think we can. Can we agree that some of that is uh, is cultish, if, if not uh, uh, an actual definition? No. Well, it's nefarious. There's no yeah. question that you know they attack people. They're bullies. You know, right. and uh, whether it's a cult or not, I, I, the reason why I avoid that word is that it, it you get people into endless arguments about whether a particular organization is a cult or not, and I just. I said, look, how, how do they behave? Do they control people? Do they try to destroy bull- their enemies? All right, uh, if you want to call that a cult, that's a cult, fine. But what's important to me is is how they act towards people. And this organization is stunning in the way it it runs roughshod over American courts. It abuses human rights. It, it makes extensive use of child labor. And – Church, cult, whatever. I mean, it's like, it's basically a mafia pretending that it's a religious organization, and and you and I are subsidizing it with our tax money, and so that's that's really what's what's at stake, and not so much, you know, whether it, it this is a cult or that's a cult, and so I try not to get hung up on that too much, but but look, they but are they are mis- seems to fit. They are mistreating people, and I like to report on that. Yeah. No, Look, t- and we appreciate you for we it. We do. Look him up at TonyOrtega.org. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, my friend. And uh, Hey, thank you. This has been great. You guys, no, that's great. Uh, join us next week for comedian Ian Ha Ha Harris on the, another edition of the Mythicist Milwaukee yeah. Show. 
I've been your host, Rob Definitely. Moore. And one of the best book teasers I've uh, heard on the podcast in a while. That, that sounds good. It does. Excellent. It does. So check it out. And uh, again, thanks for joining us on behalf of the entire team. Take it easy, everybody. Have a good Labor Day. Bye. Good. The Mythicist Milwaukee Show is brought to you by Mythicist Milwaukee. Producer Sean Frasek. Associate producer Melanie Lawson. Engineer Jason Lawson. Mythmeister Antonio Blondone. Researcher Kristen Whitaker-Hood. Closing theme written and performed by Shelley Siegel. On behalf of co-host Brian Edward and the entire team, I'm Rob Moore reminding you to keep it safe and keep it secular. <laughs> <laughs>